Hello everyone at Euroscientist. This is Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan and today I'm here with Robin Bost, Professor of Cultural Information Science at the Department of Media Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Robin was my guest on the podcast on episode number 22. It's nice to see you back, Robin. Thank you. It's nice to be back. During our interview, we mentioned and we talked about your last book, The Machine and the Ghost, Digitality and Its Consequences. And we covered some of those consequences. Targeting the audience of your scientists, that is the professionals of science, not just researchers. Would you say that digitality has impacted this sector too, that it has changed the experience of being in this profession? Oh, absolutely. In the profession of being a, a practicing scientist, absolutely. There's no question. But then digitality has impacted all of our lives. I mean, you know, we, it's, hard to, it's hard to think of any corner of experience today that isn't impacted by digitality, you know, or, or at least, you know, digital media in some form or another. You know, I even have colleagues who work in the back country of Papua New Guinea where people use their phones. You know, they use, they use uh, smartphones differently than we use them. They use it uh, peer-to-peer, so they use Bluetooth communications. And they use it for the bright lights because for crocodile hunting. Um, but, you know, still the, that sense of digitality and its pervasiveness, you know, spreads to almost every single corner. It's hard to think, you know, what career exists that isn't impacted by digital media. But is the impact superficial, right, or the substance changes? We still seek knowledge, try to find new knowledge. Are just the tools different, you know, or the changes deeper? Well, there's two questions there. There's two different questions there. On the one hand, there's the question, is it substantive? And the short answer is yes. But the other question is, is it about doing things new? or new knowledge. And that gets more complicated. You know, and I mean, to answer the first bit of the question first, and not just say yes, <laughs> you know, because that's not very helpful. Um, digitality is substantive in that we, the way we work is completely different than the way it was before. I mean, for people maybe your age, it's not quite so apparent, but for people my age, or the scientists here who are over 55 probably, or 50 even, you know, and I'm way over 55, <laughs> you know, um, we remember a time where work was fundamentally different in the way it went. It was at a different pace. Communications were slower. It was a slower pace. You had different communicative structures. And it's important not to forget those times because it's, it's the idea that then we didn't have an information culture. We didn't have information technologies, but of course we did. As a matter of fact, most of what, and this is kind of moving towards the second half of that question, most of what we have today that we call information technologies have their genealogies, their, not their foundation so much, but their genealogies. They have connect, historical connectivity to forms of working with information that goes back at least, you know, a hundred years, often further. If you think of what we do on, on, on our computers, normally if we just look at the screen, we have a desktop. And on the desktop we have files, we have folders, you know, and those get organized largely on our own. But files and folders were information technologies that were invented, by the way, they were invented at the beginning of the 20th century. I actually know who invented them, which is interesting, but <laughs> you know, even, even the lowly tab was invented by a German emigrate to New York and was bought by a company that did information technology called the Library Bureau, which interestingly was run by Melville Dewey, which of the Dewey Decimal System for libraries, yes, and he had a big company. Uh, he, so he's the one who invented card catalogs, he invented file folders, filing cabinets, these are things that were invented, right? So those technologies existed long before, and we've brought them in and translated them. They're not the same. It's not to say, okay, yeah, we had file folders and all that, and so it's the same now as it was then. It isn't. It's very different. But we translated that into this working space. And it's also interesting to see how different... So, th so that change is really fundamental. That translation changed the way we worked fundamentally. For instance, one of the reasons that Steve Jobs and also IBM early on wanted to develop those kind of interfaces, which were 
developed in other places in the in the early 70s, by the way, was that they wanted to tap a market that business was trying to develop, which was to get managers filing, organizing information, typing. Before that time, if you were a manager, even a junior manager, you did not type. I learned to type in high school, which is very interesting. I was rare. I was one of the very few people I knew who could type. You know, it was incredibly rare. The only people who typed were secretaries, who were almost exclusively women, right? Not, all, yeah, pretty much. And if you were a, a, even a junior manager, even just a, even just a supervisor, you did not type. You did not file. You didn't do any of those things. Those were technologies you never engaged with. You had people who did that for you, secretaries. Right? They did that work. So the shift that happened was literally to change us all into being secretaries in a way, which was in a way kind of democratizing. In a way, it's kind of democratizing. It's, you know, it's had a, it's had a, a, a kind of a powerful impact on our engagement with that. Of course, it's also put a lot of people out of business, right? A lot of people out of work or changed the nature of what secretaries do in a very substantive way. So that's had positive and negative impacts, right? It's just never one or the other. I think for scientists, what's interesting is, of course, what has happened also is those roles in science were often something that scientists did. You know, they did, they collected their own data, they managed their own data. That's something that's changed a bit now. Science has actually kind of gone the opposite direction. Scientists, because of digitality and because of the sheer volume that they can deal with, the kind of worlds that they can measure and inscribe and so forth, have actually distributed that work away from the scientist. So scientists now actually engage less directly with their data than they used to. They have specialists who do that. You know, so in that sense, digitality has had a fundamental impact. But I guess it's the point of a lot of my work is that to point out to people, okay, yes, these things, changes have had important impacts. They're never straightforward or simple. They're never uniform. You have to look at the context of change and how they've changed that makes the difference. We used to have physical folders before, and then we gave the same name to this abstract entity in our computers. Does this fact, the same name, show, reveal something in common there, or the name hides the fact that this new thing is a different thing than what we had before, we just used the same name to make it easier for us for some reason. Because you oh, say yeah, it yeah. changed. Yes, I mean, that's, yes, it is. I mean, and you can look at the work. Yes, I mean, in the sense, it's the same because it has been made to be the same. Now, deep down, it's very different. Of course, there's another aspect of my work, which is to show how below all these layers of, of performance of processing in the computer, you have a medium that's fundamentally different. But we can get to that later if we want. We talked about a bit about that the first time. But, of course, they were, you know, people had to make a decision, and people did make a decision, to make them seem very similar. That took work. It wasn't that they just automatically became that way. It, it took work to construct the programs and the things that made a, a, a digital file like or similar to a paper file, whether that's a data file, a ledger, or, you know, like, in a, you know, ledgers became spreadsheets, data, you know, um, you know recorded data forms became databases, um, text files became word processed files, right? So those took construction. It took a while to sort of sort those out. You know, when I was writing my, um, even starting my PhD, and I won't tell you how long ago that was, um, <laughs> that, you know, I, I, was, I was working on a mainframe with a line editor. You know, it, I didn't have access to word processing. Even though word processors existed, they were pretty rare and expensive. But that's probably why I didn't have access to it. You literally edited your thing line by line. It was a pain in the butt. It was really difficult. <laughs> it took a lot of time. But, um, you know, so those had to be constructed. People had to make them. You know, they had to decide what working with text in digital media was going to be like. And of course, what they drew from was, on the one hand, you know, to make it familiar, paper, 
And we still do a lot of paper, so you had to look like a document. That's where you get WYSIWYG, right? Now WYSIWYG comes from the 1960s. But, um, you know, so it had to look like that. But people, for instance, they were visionaries very early on, like Ted Nelson. I don't know if anybody's still, you've heard of Ted Nelson. Yeah, oh, good. Zigzag structures. A lot of people. Hmm? Zigzag structures, imposing hierarchy yes. where it doesn't belong. Well, yeah, exactly. But also, I mean, just simply his, you know, his book, I'm going to I don't have a key in the cabinet. I have an original of his book, you know, and, um, you know, from, you know, but also his early work, even as early as 1965, right? His early articles where he comes up with the term hypermedia, for instance, and hypertext. That's where the, the term comes from is his 19, 1965 article, you know, where he recognized very early on and other people like, like, you know, Doug Engelbart and others recognized that this media allows you to do something totally different with text, you know, with text, with, with representation, with imagery and so forth, to the point where it's almost bizarre if, you, if you're an historian like I am to look at the transformations that came from the understandings, the early understandings of digitality as a media from the, from the late 50s and the 60s and early 70s to what we have now, which is basically just doing largely what we did before on paper. And that was a, was a program Okay, there's a lot of business reasons for that and so forth, but that was a program that that literally had to work to try and lock down the flexibility of digitality right. to be narrowly mediated, where it's actually very flexible. You know, hugely, and you know, Ted Nelson in both in '65, but also later in his 1972 paper, book, which he self-published it's a two-sided book you read it this way and then you read the other half this way you know and, and um where he talks about how you can really th rethink what we do in terms of communicating with text with imagery and so forth on digitality that's been replayed in all sorts of research projects that look at different forms of scientific publication for instance you know for instance there's you know for science in digitality it'd be much more useful to have articles that never quite finish, that are kind of ongoing, that are part of an ongoing dialogue, so they're constantly being updated, a bit like Wikipedia, right? In other words, you have the history, but it's constantly being, it's, it's never finished, it's, it's ongoing, you know, and you have authors join and go away, but you have that history, and this is, I mean, Wikipedia does that, it's very easy to do. It's extremely easy to do that digitally. But what, so why don't scientists write that way? Now we receive quite passively, not the contents, well, too, but the structure of, and I see this changing maybe in the long term, but not in the short term. <laughs> no, it's slow working because you're up against forces that have a lot of vested interests. I mean, so for instance, I can tell you one of the reasons and scientists will probably go, yeah, absolutely, you know, that they don't publish that way. It's not because scientists don't want to publish that way, not because they are opposed to publishing that way, not because they think it's a bad idea. It's because they wouldn't keep their jobs if they did. Because <laughs> they work in largely, not exclusively, but largely scientists work in universities. And universities have, very, I'm under the same pressure, have pressure to publish in journals, just like we did in the 19th century, you know. So, you know, world-class journals, just like in the 19th century, and you publish there, and you have an article that looks like an article, it's text, you know, it looks like a printed page. You know, and Adobe came along and satisfied everybody's need by creating PDF, which is a program that is extremely complex to keep us from using text as though it was digital. <laughs> text as though it was printed. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort for the computer to not be digital, to be just like paper, right? And they did that because that's what publishers want, right? So, you know, so it's not that scientists, you know, I can point a finger at scientists or me as an academic and say, it's because we don't want to do that. It's because governments and administrators and so forth say, no, you're an academic, you publish paper-like articles, paper-like books, or paper books even, you know, even paper books or paper-like books. Think of Kindle. It's, okay, it does different things. You can, well, one thing it does is you can search for individual words, which, believe me, as someone who grew up with, you know, card catalogs, it's fantastic. <laughs> you know, that makes life a lot easier, you know. But, you know, so digitality has had its impacts and continues to. 
I mean, you look at the changes in databasing over the last 20 years. You know, in you know the the callow age of the of the web in the 1990s, even just into the 2000s, you know, the only game in town pretty much was relational databases, because they 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 filled a niche for the web and web 2.0, which it's not really a meaningful term in many ways, but okay, we'll use it anyway. You know, and it filled a niche for that interactive web that grew up fairly quickly at the end of the 90s and early 2000s. And it was convenient, it was cheap, there was open source things like MySQL and so forth that was available to people. So it was, you know, it was very easy to build on the back of, you know, of uh, basically of, of relational databases, you know, programming languages like PHP and JavaScript and so forth had libraries that linked directly into them. It's extremely easy to do. So it, it became the only game in town, relational databases. But they're not very useful because they're very restricted, very limited, very logical, and there's not, not very flexible. And so you started in the last 20 years, we've had a lot of growth in new kinds of databases. Not that it filters through to people who don't use them, but for scientists it's very important that they can have graph databases, that they can have document databases, that they can have, you know, um, you know, that they can have these different forms of databasing, that um, different ways of approaching data. So it's it's always been there in the background, and of course scientists in some ways are the more interesting people digitally because they use digitality in ways that are far more informed than most of the rest of us are allowed to. You think of astronomy. Astronomy is one of my favorite sciences. Um, one because it's cool, you know, learning about the universe is always cool, you know. But also because it's a, it's a discipline that the only access it has to what it studies is through media. Okay, we've sent, we're now sending probes, we've, you know, there are probes around. So we, but still, what we get back, you know, we don't go there. We haven't gone, to, we've gone to the moon, but we haven't gone to Mars and picked up the soil. You know, we, you know, they, they have to, they have to send something that sends media back. Now that's kind of a normal thing for science to do anyway. That's been happening since the since the 16th century but you know in a way but you know the you know with the the you know the voyages of the 16th 17th and 18th century were scientific voyages right they they were satellites <laughs> we sent out satellites we were people satellites but they we sent out satellites they collected data and sent it back right so that's a kind of way of science but the manipul the use of digitality to do different things computationally but also representationally is really interesting. It's really interesting around astronomy, but also a lot of other sciences in particular, where they really do have to think about the digitality as a medium to get information out of it. It's really, 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 really. anyway. Just I'm, going, to give I'm, the... I'm doing what I always do, which is to run on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give the devil its due, when first computers came around, so to speak, the early technology, held the promise of becoming widespread they whoever they is had to come up with this metaphors and we knew the real world paper files folders could have we imagined something different you know Absolutely. at all or that was the most obvious thing to do because sometimes when you think of how limiting it is, you almost want to think that someone is keeping us limited and there are bad reasons why we're not exploiting the potential of this technology. But it was also just the most obvious thing to do. Yeah, I think it's a very complex question. But first of all, I think, yes, it, it could always have been different. And, it, and in a sense, it is different. I think the audience as well, being scientists, will say, well, yes, of course it's different because they actually do a lot of different things. But these are most of the difference exists on a very technical scale or in a technical community of practice or very small scales. It isn't, you know, it isn't the sort of thing that gets raised up for some uh, apps that we buy. You know, so it is very, there is a lot of experimentation out there in, in art, in science, and so forth, around digitality and its potentials. That's happening all the time. So it, it is different in a way. The problem is the dominant forms fall into the kind of current, which is a current economic situation. It has nothing to do with digitality. The moment, because we have large monopolies, pretty much, or not monopolies, but, you know, dominant corporate entities, especially in information, pretty much like the early 20th century 
you know, oil and gas industry, where you had very few players who dominated the field, you don't get a lot of choice because you get what they decide is valuable for them to sell, you know, or to use to sell on to other people as Facebook and, you know, and, and the social media does. They, they do what's useful for them to gather your data so they can process it and sell those interpretations onto people for advertising, right? They're, you know, they're, they're an advertising medium. You know, that's what they do. So they decide that. And so the, the current kind of, you know, uh, lack of choice that we have is comes out of an economic system. It has nothing to do with digitality. And in fact, digital, the kind of potential of digitality, I'm using digitality very general because it was different things. As soon as computers became binary, and early computers, some were and some weren't, the U.S. tended early on in the 40s to go with what they called uh, decimal computing or analog computing sometimes. And in Europe, they moved, especially in Britain, moved very quickly into binary very early. And now we're all binary. I mean, there's nothing but binary. But, um, you know, but very early on, I mean, very early on, there was a recognition of the potential of this as a medium. It's partially what my book's a bit about, but not exclusively, but it's well documented anyway. You have to realize, you know, the first computer graphic was done in 1949. You know, the first computer game came out a few months later on the same computer, Whirlwind and, and MIT. The game was really kind of boring. You set up some parameters and a little, a little light came and bounced on the ground. You tried to bounce it into a hole. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, you know, that was pretty much it. It wasn't that exciting, but, uh, you know, it was the first one. It was, and graphics. So graphics came on, and very quickly you saw experimentation because these computers were getting changed very quickly. So a lot of people were building, there weren't many of them around. I mean, you know, we're talking a couple of hundred, but they were constantly going through new versions. So the old versions would be kept running and delegated down to other people in the university or in the Defense Department or whatever to practice on. So you had people doing digital music, text analysis, cataloging ideas, uh, uh, digital art, and things like that in the 1950s. Because if you were in the university, there was the, you know, version minus two, of this, you know, this computer the size of this house, you know, was there for you to play with. You know, and computing scientists were playing with it as well. So if you were an MA student, you could come and play on the, if you're willing to get up at three o'clock in the morning for time sharing, you could go and do experimentation. You know, it's where we got the first CAD systems from, you know, in the ni late 1950s, from PhD students getting up at three o'clock in the morning, just building this stuff on the computer because it was available to them. So, but this kind of use of this experimentation, and then this recognition in the early 60s that this was a fundamentally different kind of medium. You could, you could have completely different forms of documents. You could have completely different forms of texts. You could have, you know, texts that interacted with each other, which is what, you know, it's what, you know, Ted Nelson talked about. You know, and yes, you know, in 1965, he's saying these things, you know. And then it narrowed down. Yeah, then, you know, and again, you look at things like what, um, what they were doing at Xerox Park, for instance, in the early 70s, where you do get the desktop, you know, and Alan Kay and his team there were, you know, that, you know, they were talking very early 60s, we're talking about 60, uh, 1970, sorry, early 70s, 1970 to 76, pretty much, 75, 76, at Xerox Park. And they are building desktops. They're building new forms of language, small talk, which is still used today. They built that so that they could work with kids because they found kids as programmers more creative than adults. Um, they're doing digital music. They have laser printers, video, digital video, local area networks. Um, this comes about partially because you get the microchip, right? So the microchip allows for these experimentations to happen to a degree. And, um, you know, and they're building all this stuff. And it was then 1979, once they'd gone down that road, but Xerox didn't develop it very much, but they had microcomputers that were had the desktop and things on them and interesting operating systems and a visit from, you know, a small California startup um, going to see them in 1979, which was Steve Jobs from Apple. And he sees this and he goes, ah, ah but I can do something else with this. This is for education. They thought it was for education. 
They didn't see it as a business as a business tool. They saw it as an educational tool, especially for kids, small kids. And so there were a lot of programming languages developed just for kids, you know, at that time. And um, they're still around, Logo Script and things like that. But um, you know, and then he said, ah, but what we can do is we can create something that's more office based. Right. And he starts he starts the you know, he starts the Mac development. So it was the Macintosh that started there. Of course there was conflict because, you know, Woz, his his partner, Steve Wozniak, better known as Woz, had been developing the Lisa, which was a very different model. Completely different model of, of programming, of using of the computer, a different way of working with text. It was much more open to programming and change, much more flexible. The desktop was not so set. You could you could you could develop things on there yourself. It was a different model of of doing things. And and Woz lost the battle at Apple and left. Came back later. He's still there. But um, you know, and Steve Jobs won it. And then Mac became that. And then you had IBM reacting and you know and giving a contract out of the blue to a small startup in Seattle called Microsoft. You know, who, you know, you know, so who bought a programming from a guy called the, you know, uh, QDOS, which meant quick and dirty operating system. <laughs> you know, so didn't mean disk operating system, it meant quick and dirty operating system. So uh, I was pretty cludged, you know, and then all of a sudden these things became a tool for business. And that became a very dominant thing. So it's hard now to escape that. Actually, without that, would have society been changed so much? No, because it had to be large scale to bring a large scale change. Yeah, probably. I think that's a very good point, is that would we have had the same level of change if something like Lisa had come along, which demands you to take on a lot of responsibility for making these things work, you know, which is like the old computers, right? And then you just would have been a bunch of, you know, California guys sitting around in garages, right? It wouldn't have been so powerful. Of course, it probably would have found its way into there at some point anyway, because of just the sheer diversity of what was going on, but someone else probably would have done it, but um, or something similar. But it would have been different. It would have been different. A lot of what we wind up with now is because of those commitments, technological commitments which were made at the time, that get embedded, and then it doesn't determine what comes next. I think that's the mistake. You don't think it determines what comes next, but it it's just so hard to change it. It takes so much extra effort and, and expense to change that that it it just it, it kind of is, it has an impetus it has a, you know has an inertia it's hard to stop that that ball rolling because it has such an inertia so because of that but we're already seeing some change to that and the thing that changed of course is mobility I mean it's the the cell phone because our computing now is becoming it's shifting so we're moving away from a typewriter with a screen which dominated for so long. You know, really that was the model that existed from the late 40s, you know, and early 50s. And now that's that's changing. I mean, the reason that the early computer desktop computers were a box the way they were is because IBM made the decision to make them look like that so that people would associate those with the computers they saw on the NASA spacecraft. Is, you know, it's called it's called the NASA box, right? I mean, because you know, so people say, ah, oh, we're buying the what same thing, the they... same thing that they have on the spacecraft. You know, <laughs> what else could they have done? Well, I Apple mean... was doing something very different. It had a completely different model, and for a long time, you know, we have to remember now with Apple being the largest company, one one of the largest companies in the world now, that for a long time Apple was a small player. And people were saying, I remember in the in the you know even in the 80s and early 90s, saying Apple will never have more than 10% of the market because it's so unusual because it's so different. It was really only with mobile with the cell phones and the iPhone that Apple started growing so fast. Uh, when they were in, when they were the box and they had I mean you think of the the Macintosh all the different versions of the Macintosh were in design terms were incredibly diverse and, and interesting. One last question. Mm -hmm. You said that it's important not to forget mm. how it used to be. Uh, but you teach young students. They don't know how no. it used to be. You teach them so that they know. But won't we forget anyway as we are born into the new culture? We do. Yeah, I mean, part of the things that the new business model demands is forgetting. 
It wants you to forget. It wants us to forget what it was like because it wants to be seen as new. It wants to be seen as completely new. And the only option. And the only option. Yes, exactly. You buy us because we're new and we're the only option. We're the ideal option, right? Okay, so that's not true. They're not new. I mean, there's newish things, but they're not new. And it's not the only option. You know, there's a lot of options. Um, but of course, that's a business. But, you know, we should be clever enough to understand that's a you know, okay, the, the, the company's in business to make money. I mean, of course, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't survive. But, you know, our economy also promotes that. I mean, that now all of us have to be productive. You don't really have an option. We do. I mean, there's the potential for an alternative. But if it's not out there on the market, you're not going to build your own machine. Why not? <laughs> it's not hard. All right. <laughs> a lot of my friends Sorry. do. A lot of my artist friends do. I mean, there's, there's the, you know, there's a lot of little computer, you know, the strawberry pie. I mean, you can build your own stuff on that. I have artist friends who build their own computers. They build their own, you know, to to break that mold. Right. It's part of their art. But also, we're talking to a community that does that. You know, the the scientists. I mean, they would say, well, yeah, but that's all we do. You know, we're constantly building new. Computers. We're constantly building new digital devices. We're constantly building new digital entities. We're constantly programming new new models and new ideas. That's what they do now, and that's the change that's happened in science. Is that where before there was a you know it was it was about building the laboratory and the instruments and so forth. Now it's about building these digital tools. I mean, of course, it's also about building instruments, you know. But so much of that that that's. You know, that's bread and butter for these people. That's what they do. And Alan Kay, who came up with the original ideas, well, not alone, he and his team and his kids who he was working with, you know, who created the model that we're stuck with in a way of the desktop and things, he still says the revolution hasn't even begun. The digital revolution has not yeah. begun and yeah. will not begin until we, we all program. Until we all program and build our own stuff, that's when the revolution will come. So for this audience... They're saying, well, yeah, duh, <laughs> you know, that's what we do, right? Scientific revolution happened around digital talent because that's what we do. Now, okay, you know, they have the money, they have the infrastructure, they have, they're able to buy in the expertise. Some of them have their own expertise and the rest of us don't. But we don't, be, you know, because it's seen as something outside of our capability. It's also because it's marketed as something you can't do. Now, if... You know, if in 1970s, you know, Alan Kay was able to sit down with a bunch of kids from age six to 14, you know, and build things like sound synthesizers, you know, program sound synthesizers with those kids doing it. Why can't we? We can. It's not that hard. We can. Thank you very much, Robin. I love talking to you. <laughs> it's always fun.